Um, David was um, raised and lives in Denver. He attended Arizona State University and Metropolitan State College and majored in fine arts. In the mid 80s, he began a career as an illustrator. His clients included um, Coors, Playboy, and Keystone Ski Resort, just to mention a few. In the early 90s, he began uh, working in television, creating uh, graphic animations for CBS in Denver. Three years later, he moved to STARS, um, a large premium cable channel, um, where he became a director of on-air design. During that time, David received uh, many awards, including regional Emmys. He painted on the side during that time whenever time would allow. Early in 2013, after 20 years at STARS, he left his position there to pursue painting full time. You all probably will recognize his work from the Coors auction, where he's been exhibiting for some time. Um, David paints vintage cowboys, landscapes, figures, collage type imagery infused with a distinctly romantic contemporary nostalgic air. All of his paintings are grounded in visually strong compositions and executed in vibrant colors. He seeks to put the viewer in a nostalgic narrative, a bittersweet environment where boundaries of memory and longing are blurred. He's influenced by pop culture and the early illustrators of the 20th century. It's my distinct pleasure and Matt About's Art's pleasure to introduce David Kamersel. David, take it away. Oops. David can't take it away because I have a mute. So hold on just a second. While you're unmuting him, I might mention if you have any questions, put them in the chat and I'll monitor that and we will have a Q&A at the very end, so. So David, just go ahead and, and say, yeah. there, you there you go. Hello. Hello, everyone. Thank you for that nice introduction. I feel like uh, we've just about covered everything. So maybe we should just wrap up now and say thanks very much. <laughs> um, somebody um, said a while ago, they wanted to hear about my early beginnings and how I got started in art. And uh, that's been like really a long, uh, journey and kind of a roundabout uh, process to get to where I'm at now. And uh, I, I did go to school for uh, fine art. I went to uh, Arizona State for a semester and I was so homesick there that I, I wanted to come back home after uh, just the first semester. And then uh, the following year I enrolled in uh, at uh, Metropolitan State College. But like many uh, teenagers, I was uh, very headstrong uh, big on attitude, short on uh, self-esteem, and it was hard to tell me anything, much less teach me anything, and especially about art, which I felt like, since I knew how to draw a little bit, that, you know, I was, I knew all this stuff, and what are we doing, and another part of the problem was I didn't really know, uh, didn't have interest much in, in, in anything else. So it was kind of like art or, or nothing for me, uh, but I wasn't a good student, as you can imagine, and my grades were falling and trouble at home. And I decided that, well, maybe I just need to uh, kind of get out in the world and, and see what happens. And so I, uh, I left college and um, did what a lot of young kids my age were doing. And that was 
work in restaurants. And I worked in restaurants for about uh, 10 years, uh, waited tables, bartended for a long time, managed a little bit and um, tried to do that while I was trying to figure out what I was gonna do with the rest of my life. And I liked art. I was doing art on the side during all this time, but um, it was hard for me to see how this was gonna translate into some sort of career and how I could make any money doing this. And uh, you know, most of the art teachers don't talk about how to have a career, they just, you know, say, well, well, let's paint this still life or whatever, but they don't get into much real world um, experiences. So it was kind of frustrating. So I was just doing art on the side and it was just for me, it was very personal. I wasn't showing anywhere and it was a way to um, give me some self-esteem because I didn't really have a lot else going on for myself. So during this time, I would start running into uh, design and illustration jobs. And they would just kind of come by every uh, once in a while. And I'm not even sure how they came to me, but they did. And I was really interested in illustration and design. And um, some of the uh, old world uh, illustrators from the early 1900s to the 1950s really influenced me. I just love their work. Uh, J.C. Leyendecker, Norman Rockwell, and N.C. Wyeth, and there's just a whole list of these guys that just blew me away. And um, I was just so enamored with their technical skills. And it's like, wow, this is really great. And then I started thinking, well, maybe there's a way here to make a living doing design and illustration work. And so even though I was still working in restaurants, I started picking up more illustration and design work. But it was kind of like this, you know, I would have some fat periods where I was really busy and making some money and then I'd have periods where I wasn't. And that was kind of driving me crazy because I wanted a steady paycheck. You know, I wanted, um, I didn't want to live hand to mouth. I wanted to, you know, I wanted something more stable, more secure than that was providing me. And I was trying to figure out what that was and what I should do. And um, somehow I started thinking about television graphics. I think I was watching the news and uh, they called them the overhead sh shoulder graphics where the guy would be talking and there would be some graphic next to him. You know, if it was a crime story, there'd be a picture of handcuffs or a fingerprint or something up there. And I was like, I could so do that. I could so do that. I could just nail that. Um, so I started sending resumes to the local TV stations and um, just to see what would happen. And lo and behold, one of them called me back and asked me if I wanted to intern. Well, I'm in my 30s now. And I thought, wow, interning in my 30s, this is kind of unusual. I said, heck yeah, I'll do that. And they said, well, you gotta, you gotta be in school. And so I said, well, all right, hang on, let me see what I can do. So I did some researching and I found out there was computer graphics classes I could take. So I did that and that was how I got my foot in the door in the uh, big new world of computer graphics. So um, not long after that, I was actually hired on at Channel 4, uh, which at the time was an NBC station and it was kind of weird. They, changed to a CBS station later, and I'm still trying to figure out how that works. But at any rate, um, I worked there for uh, a few years and uh, it was it was pretty cool. And I made those little graphic things like, you know, I could knock those out of the park, you know. But um, news is a stressful environment. I mean, it was, whoa. I mean, always stuff going on and at the time, there was like eight hours of news programming every day, which is a ton. And graphics were like really a cool new thing. So everybody wanted graphics. You know, oh, we need graphics for this, graphics for that. And there was Bronco shows and there was CU shows. And oh, it was just a never ending list. And um, I was just getting ground down. And uh, one day, one of the reporters came in and was asking me for something. And I'm like, dude, I'd love to help you, but I don't know when I can do this with all this other stuff I have to do. 
And so he took offense to that and went to my boss. And he said, yeah, David refused me. He told me I couldn't have any graphics. So I got called to the principal's office and here's my rebellious nature coming out again. And I said, I don't know what I could do though. I mean, I'm kind of up to my eyebrows in work and there's nobody managing the flow. I mean, what do you want? And they said, well, you can't, you can't say no. And I'm like, really? Well, okay, all right. And I knew at that point that me and that job were, were gonna be parting ways pretty soon. And shortly after that, I had a friend that was working at Stars, and she called me up and said, do you wanna come for an interview? And I'm like, heck yeah. So I interviewed and um, got the job. And it's really funny, I thought I was so slick. I uh, was interviewing her and, um, she said, well, how much money do you want? You know, what, what do you think your salary should be? And I was feeling really cocky and I took out a pen and paper and I wrote down a number and I pushed it across the table to her. And she looked at it and she goes, done, just instantly. So we shook hands and oh yeah, happy days. And then later she goes, you know what? I would have, I would have paid more. And I said, that's okay, I would have taken less. <laughs> so it all worked out. and. Um, I was hired on as a designer there and it was great. It was really creative. Um, computer graphics are amazing. The stuff that you can do with them, you can bring film, you can bring calligraphy, you can bring all various art forms into the process and you can just get some amazing results. And the technology was just going up and up and up with the things you could do. So pretty fascinating, cool world. And um, I got my steady job and I was pretty happy and um, they liked what I was doing and they kept promoting me and promoting me and promoting me until pretty soon I was the head of the whole department. And um, when you're the head of the department though, it's not so creative anymore. You're managing other designers and managing other designers is kind of like herding cats. You know, it's, it's not easy to get designers to go where you want them to go because they all got their own ideas about what it should be and how it should be and so on. Uh, so my interest in the job was kind of going like this and all this time now, mind you, I still been painting on the side. And I kept wondering, it's like, well, how can I paint more and maybe do this less? You know, is there something I could do? But I mean, the job paid fantastic and I got great benefits and um, it was hard to say no it was hard to to just bail on that and um, <clears throat> one day I was in uh, Los Angeles on on uh, through a job uh, thing through work and uh, there was an artist there that uh, I really admired his work and uh, he had his phone number on his web page and I just got a wild hair and I just called the guy and I said, man, I just love your stuff. Can I come visit your studio? And to my surprise, he said, yeah, come on over. Well, it just blew me away. I mean, he was so nice, so gracious. And, uh, you know, I wonder if I could return that favor if somebody called me up out of the blue and wanted to come visit. I'm not so sure how I would be that gracious, but he, he really was. And we sat and chatted for a couple hours. He bought me coffee and, uh, I showed him some of my work and um, he told me about a little bit about how he got started. And I'm like, maybe I could do this. Maybe I could do this painting thing. But again, the hook was still too strong and too, and I had it firmly in my mouth with the paycheck and the benefits. Couldn't figure out how to, to cut the cord. Well, fast forward to 2013 and I've been there for 20 years and uh, I got called into the uh, uh, HR office and they said, we've eliminated your position. And I was like, what? <laughs> and I, I could never get a, a straight answer of why or what happened. And I talked to the senior VP of uh, HR and she was like, well, it's not performance. I mean, we love what you're doing, but, and I'm like, well, but what, you know, <laughs> what's, what's going on? Still could never get an answer, but, and I thought about, well, maybe I should pursue graphics or get a, another similar job somewhere, but I thought, you know, I think this is the universe telling me to go out and start painting. 
And so it was in 2013, I got a big kick in the pants to get out there. And so that's, that's what I did. So I've been painting professionally ever since then. So that's how I got to where I'm at now. So Joan, if you're ready, let's jump into the slideshow here. There you go. Can can you see? There's me. Yeah. All right. So when I first started uh, painting professionally, I wasn't sure what direction. I mean, I had a lot of things that I liked, and uh, one of those things was these kind of architectural type portraits. So you may recognize this as um, Union Station. It's called Ravel by Tray because it's cropped in kind of a weird way that those are the letters that you see. But I had this you know, sense of nostalgic, which really has influenced almost everything that I do. I try and bake that into uh, all of my pieces. Um, I don't know if you've ever watched Mad Men, but they had an episode on nostalgia where they said that in Greek, nostalgia means the pain from an old wound. And I thought, wow, I, that's fascinating. And I, I said, I really can kind of relate to that. You know, there's something about nostalgic where it's like, oh, it's so sweet, that memory, but you can't really get there. You can't really touch it. You know, it's just out there somewhere. But I've always liked that, uh, that notion. Um, so I was doing a lot of these architectural type portraits and they have that sense of nostalgia and especially since the older architecture. Let's go to the next one. If anybody has a question, go ahead and shout out if, if something about any of these. This is a Chamberlain Observatory, which is just around the corner from me. And uh, we had a neighbor, I think she felt sorry for me that I lost my job. So she commissioned me to paint the observatory. Um, but I was really happy with the way it came out. And again, it, I, I think it, you know, it does have that kind of sense of nostalgic to it and try and pay homage to uh, all those illustrators that I admired so much. So let's go to the next one. Here's another shot of the observatory. I'm trying to get a little whimsical and playful with the Zeppelin up in the sky. And if you've been by this observatory, you'll know that the mountains aren't actually behind it. They're more to the left of it. But I was just uh, taking some creative liberties here with it. And uh, I was really happy with the way this piece turned out. There was, um, I donated this to my son's school auction. And somebody had put an ink mark on the, the painting right underneath the, the Zeppelin. So, so I had to like do some repair and some repainting, which I was really annoyed about. But it was like, OK, note to self, you got to make sure these things are carefully uh, wrapped up during transportation here to avoid such things. So let's go to the next one. And this is um, Lakeside Tower. You may recognize it. Um, me and a friend went over there because that place is just nostalgic city. And um, just everywhere you look is just like a vision of, uh, of the past. We we're getting ready to leave and I looked at the tower and this is the way you go out and everything was kind of in shadows but the light was hitting the tower and I was like, wow, that's really something. So I uh, took some photos of it to do this painting and um, a lot of times, um, most of the time with my work, it's just a pure visual statement and arrangement of elements. It's not, um, I usually don't have any underlying messages or hidden meanings to my pieces. There's usually no narrative, but a lot of times um, one will come about kind of serendipitously through the process. And, and this was one of those where um, I was painting this, I believe in uh, 2005. And um, my dad was, was dying at the time. He had cancer and was had a, a few months to live. And uh, I, I wasn't sure what the Reddit at the bottom meant. I thought it was exit. I don't think that's really what it is. I think it's something else, but um, it all sort of 
had this sort of spiritual passing of life kind of significance where he was going off to this other place there. And um, so his piece became Jacob's Ladder because that was my dad's name. And Jacob's Ladder is the Jacob Ascension to heaven. So some of these have a little more spiritual meaning to me than, than others. Let's go to the next one, please. Another architectural uh, little gem. This is a house on South Downing Street. And I just uh, love the architecture of this little house. And um, whoop. there's um, the, the whole background is kind of made up. And it's very much influenced by uh, looking at Max Hill Parish paintings. This is called When Whippoorwills Call, which is the opening line to the uh, song, My Blue Heaven. So let's move on. So other than uh, architectural portraits, I was also interested in uh, working from uh, just found photos in people's old snapshots. And I would go through, uh, I would look on eBay and just garage sales and stuff. And people have tons of these snapshots around. And uh, most of them are pretty bad. And I thought they would make for great paintings. But I thought I was particularly enamored with this one with these two women. And I'm just making up their names. I have no idea who they were. Um, but it just uh, put me in that time zone back to that uh, place and time. And it was uh, this was a, a fun piece to, to paint. Let's go to the next one. And this is another one, found photograph. And I think I kind of uh, doctored in the background. She was sitting on the car, but I think the background was all invented. I call it prelude because uh, my dad had some photos like these of his girlfriends when they would go out on date. He's kind of an amateur shutter bug. So I'm like, okay, I think we all can see where this might be going. So I called this one uh, prelude. And, uh, oh. whoops, sorry. Yeah, that's all right. Go forward one more. Oh, wait a minute. Stay there for just, so can you back up once? So in these early paintings too, I was always uh, a little bit conflicted about how to uh, put my name in there because I had such a long name, it seemed like it was kind of cumbersome. So I would go along with um, using initials. So if you look in the license plates there, I stuck my initials on in the license plate. Now you can go forward. Um, so this one, I found another photograph and uh, this one again has sentimental nostalgic value for me because I had an uncle in Texas who had a gas station that looked pretty much like this and uh, uh, had a lot of fond memories of, of working there, not working there, but being there. I was much too young to be working there, but he was great. He was really a lot of fun. And every time he'd go over there, he'd be, hey, how about a soda pop? And he would pull an old soda pop out of the, uh, the cooler and it was just uh, fun, fun memories there. Uh, but I had a lot of fun working on this piece. All right, let's see what's next. Um, this one is completely inventive where uh, I'm just putting a bunch of elements together. And uh, this was something that I would do at STARS where you had to, um, you had to express your ideas before you could actually do the, the piece. You needed to get sign off from all of your higher ups and clients and so on. And so we would make Photoshop mock-ups of what we thought the piece would look like so people could pass around and see. And uh, I used that process here. This may have been one of the first pieces where I put that. So the, this is a completely invented scene and I would sort of make like a collage mock-up in Photoshop with all of these elements to put it together. So again, the line is, um, you must remember this, it's um, as time goes by. So again, a lot of nostalgic references here. Let's see. And then this one is a little, another one of uh, kind of a cross between landscape and cityscape and uh, I don't know, maybe some of the architectural stuff. This is near my house where I was just walking along and just saw this 
incredible storm brewing with a kind of light coming through in the background and I took some photos and turned it into this painting. So that was a, a fun piece too. Let's go to the next one. It's kind of a still life thing. Um, again, an old phone, which I have in my studio. It's called a red bar phone and it has these very nice art deco lines and designs to them. Um, trying to uh, not say anything other than just a visual composition of colors and uh, compositions within. I saw a question there, I couldn't quite see what it said though. I guess we'll save it for, for later then. All right, well, let's move to the next. And this is uh, one of the landscapes, one of my more favorite landscapes that I did. And um, I actually have some family farm property near Johnstown and that's where this was. Uh, I just liked all the, the rolling hills, big expanses of uh, pasture land. And then uh, there would be like this isolated storm. And that's something they would always say, oh, it looks like it may rain today. Yeah, she may, she may rain. So that's where the title comes from. And it was uh, fun to see this piece again. So David, I'll throw in one question. In 20, yeah. since you were showing your early works, in 2013, how long did it take to establish an income you could live on? Well, that's a good question. Um, let me uh, keep going because that's going to okay. be um, that's going to be a, that's a great question. But let's um, I'll, I will get to that. And good. this is one of my uh, more collagey type pieces where. Uh, Again, completely made up stuff. You know, I got the pen up and the eight ball and the bowling alley. And the title is The Golden Mean of Saturday Night. And I don't know how many of you are out there that are familiar with the golden mean, but it's that uh, spiral graph thing that's in the background. And some artists will profess that uh, compositions will need to fall within the golden mean to be a truly dynamic thing. and I think it's all kind of hogwash in the, you could put this curly Q thing, the spiral thing on top of anything, and you could probably, it would look like it was part of that. But at any rate, um, I have that golden mean symbol graph back there. And then there's things of what guys do on Saturday night. You know, they go bowling, they play pool and they go cruising for girls, you know? So this is the golden mean of Saturday night. And this is an example of some of these more collage things um, that I was doing. Uh, can you go to the next one, please? So David, what we saw can was- I just, Can I just interject something? Will you just please yeah. repeat the quote from Mad Men about nostalgia before we move on to- Yeah, comment? they said that um, in, in Greek, nostalgia means the pain from an old wound. And um, I, I really like that quote. I, I think it has so much meaning to it. And I actually researched it and it's not, it's not true. There's no, that's not what the word means, but I love it. And it, it seems to fit with my feelings about nostalgia. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a great line. None of it's true, but it's, it's still a great line. Thank you. Yeah. So. As we've been looking at these pieces, you can see I got some cityscapes, I got some landscapes, I got uh, some of these like photo snaps, you know, vintage snaps of old photos. I got these collage things. Could you uh, go to the next one, Joan, please? And then in the midst of all of that, I did this piece too, which was like one of the first cowboy pieces that I done. So to get back to answering the question about how long did it take and those first three years or so, you know, I was making some nice paintings and I, I think all of those are worthwhile paintings and happy with them, but I just wasn't really selling a lot. And it was very discouraging to me. And I was trying galleries and galleries are kind of weird where they'll 
you'll send them stuff and sometimes they'll answer and say, no, thank you. But other times they won't even answer you. And I'm trying to figure out where to show and how to get some traction going with my career. And I entered the Coors show and would get turned down and I would enter Cherry Creek Arts Festival and get turned down. And um, I did a couple of shows up in the mountains. I did one in, um, in Aspen because I thought Aspen would be a good place. I felt like there might be some symbiotic energy where my pieces might resonate with the residents. Um, and it was a big deal, you know, I bought a tent and the panels and that was a pretty good investment. Um, and then got a U-Haul and hauled all that stuff and paintings up to the mountains and uh, it was a big deal. And I sold nothing, I sold zero paintings. And I was so discouraged and I, I was literally crying in my hotel room like that night. I was just like, what am I doing? You know, what is going on here? how can I make this work or should I just go back and try and find a graphic job somewhere? And so I did a little soul searching and I decided that maybe my vision was too wide. Maybe I was trying to paint too many different types of things. I mean, in my mind, all of these pieces seem to be of a similar nature in the way that they were painted, but the subject matter was kind of all over the place and it was kind of a hard, difficult sell um, you know, people didn't get it right away. And um, I talked to some artists at uh, the Cherry Creek Arts Festival and they suggested that I do almost like a theme for next year's show to enter. You know, just try and really narrow it down to like, you know, just a, a, a few things. So I decided to try these cowboys because they are kind of fun. And I felt like there was a lots of um, direction to go with these things. And um, so I entered uh, the show um, based on cowboys. And to my surprise, I got in. So I thought, aha, you know, now maybe we're getting somewhere. So this piece was like one of the first ones. Um, and it has a lot of the elements that I use going forward, which this is a uh, black and white photo that I worked with and then in the color scheme, but then also invent the the background and this one's pretty simple but uh, you know it's the idea of like a design or a pattern with these old uh, rugged cowboys um, I thought was kind of an interesting mix can we uh, go to the next one please and this is another one uh, early on this one's um, bigger much bigger this is almost uh, I think it was about 48 by 48 inches so about four by four feet and I was uh, like the way putting these patterns together with the, the cowboys, you know, it was kind of like these dusty, rugged cowboys along with your grandma's uh, wallpaper, you know, I thought was kind of an interesting mix of stuff. Um, and I would find these photos in uh, historical archives, uh, libraries, and so on. And this one's called Bert Shanks, and he was a, a performer in Buffalo Bill's Wild West show. And um, you know, working with these figures for a while, you kind of get a sense of their personalities. I mean, this piece probably took like three or four weeks to work on and, but you get a sense of who they were and you know, what, what they were like. And the Wild West show is a big deal. I mean, back in the late 1800s, early 1900s. I mean, that was probably like the greatest show on earth. I mean, when you think about what was available for entertainment, especially in small towns across the West. I mean, you know, there's no movies, there's no TV, there's probably not plays, there may be. So when this thing rolled through, I mean, it was like a big, big deal. So I think these guys are kind of like rock stars in a sense, you know, at least in that era. And that sense of pride, I think, started to come through for me uh, when I was working on these. Uh, let's go to the next one. And uh, this one's Pedro Esquivel, another performer. But again, I, you know, that sense of pride and like, yeah, I'm a, I'm a rock star and I know it, you know, kind of comes through. So no patterns here, but I do have like this kind of stylized background. And, um, uh, and that would become kind of part of this template of pieces as well. 
So now these pieces are starting to sell and they're starting to sell fairly quickly. Like I, I had one show at, um, at uh, Cherry Creek Arts Festival and I, I sold about half my pieces. So I was um, feeling pretty good about that. But then I still had a lot of pieces left over and I thought I would try Santa Fe again because I tried the galleries in Santa Fe, not Santa Fe Street, but Santa Fe, New Mexico. And uh, I would send them some stuff and they were like, yeah, thanks, but no thanks. And then uh, I said, okay, well, if you change your mind, you know, let me know. And I included one of these cowboys and they're like, whoa, 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 wait a minute. We didn't see these cowboys. And uh, I mean, it was just one image and boom, you know, got in. So it's, it's funny how these really changed the, my, my trajectory. Let's go to the uh, next one, please. This one's bad ombres, uh, again, with the flowered pattern. Um, that yellow in the background is what I paint most of my pieces. Uh, I toned the canvas that color and then all the other colors are on top of that. And I paint in kind of a transparent, semi-transparent tone. So a lot of that yellow shows through on the, uh, on the colors on top. Um, and it also sort of unifies the palette, I think. Uh, let's go to the next one. Same idea here with the, uh, the, uh, the background. And uh, you can see in his glove, the uh, figure in the darker coat, that glove is just the underpainting mostly. But you can see how that color is sort of influencing all the other colors. It's called Western Gothic because I thought it was kind of a funny play on uh, American Gothic, that painting by Grant Wood, you know, the guy with the pitchfork with his wife. Uh, let's go to the next one, please. So this is kind of a milestone piece too, where um, I, I had the, the figure in Photoshop and I had these different patterns and you think that, oh, you get a figure, you get a pattern, you slap them together and off you go. But it doesn't really work that way for me where, you know, I go through a lot of patterns and, you know, stuff just doesn't feel right. And I just wasn't getting anywhere. And I, when I was putting this presentation together, I, I must have had eight previous reiterations of this piece before I settled on this. And I was kind of exasperated as to what to do. And I decided, I wonder if, what it would look like if I ran this pattern through his shirt. And, uh, you know, the results I thought was really cool. You know, it was something really different and it was fun. And this piece I sold unfinished by posting it on uh, Facebook. Mm -hmm. And um, it was going for a one man show that I had in Santa Fe because they were loving the cowboys and they wanted more of them. Um, so this piece was in the show, but it had sold even before it got there. So can we go to the next one, please? So there's a collector in Santa Fe who's been one of my bigger collectors and he was bummed out that he didn't get your Huckleberry, uh, the, the previous piece on the red. And so he wanted to commission me to do uh, another piece like that. So I did uh, this one of Buck, which I was really happy with. Oh, can we go back? I'm sorry, Joan, could you go back uh, one? This piece also is the first one where I photoshopped somebody else's face on a historic cowboy. And the, the thing with photography from the late 1800s, early 1900s is the cameras were primitive and you needed these really, really long exposures to get an image. And so they would have to sit there for several seconds. And this is kind of a new art form. People don't know what to do. They don't know how to art direct. They don't know how to pose or even smile for the camera. So a lot of the figures were just very bland and would have really uninteresting looks on their face. And so being a former art director and kind of critiquing and criticizing every piece of the image, I thought oh, this thing needs a different face. So I Photoshop somebody else's face onto this. So can we go to the next one, please now? So this one is kind of the same way where I had this cowboy, but his 
features and his expression were just, you know, kind of sour and kind of a downer. And so I found this image of um, Buck Jones, who was a silent, silent film star and uh, did many, many Westerns. And he had a great, great face. Um, and I love the lighting. And so now we're bringing kind of up in the ante on faces and lighting and posing and stuff. And I'm like, okay, this is, this is pretty fun. So um, he, this was his uh, commission and he was, he was very happy with it. And, uh, and I asked him, I said, well, would you mind if we make prints of this? And he's like, no, that's cool. So um, I have an edition of 50 prints of this and they're all gone. I think I have like four left. So what year shameless would, plug here. If, if, if anybody wants a print, let me know. Yes, what go ahead. What year would this have been now? This would have been um, maybe 2018, to somewhere along there. Okay. Um, and also there was a restaurant downtown that called me up and they said, we're open this place, it's called West of Surrender. It's on the 16th Street Mall and they were asking if I wanted to do a piece for them. And I said, well, how big a piece and when do you need it? And they say, well, it's huge and we need it like in a few weeks. And I'm like, there's no way, you know, there's no way. Um, so we talked and actually made like a giant print of this. And so if you go in the restaurant, you'll see a big five by five foot print of this piece in their restaurant. They actually painted their wall to match this wallpaper background that it's on. And then they, they told me about what they were planning to do. And I was like, oh no, that sounds terrible. Um, and I tried like crazy to talk them out of it, but uh, they, were, they were like, no, this is what we're gonna do. And I saw it and I was actually, I was actually uh, surprised. It looked way better than I thought it was going to. So designers aren't always right, you know. So let's go for one more. So the same guy, even though he really liked Buck, he called me and said, I, I want another piece, but just do it in red. He says, I really love those, you know, deep red tones that you got. And I was like, okay, you know, and I said, anything else? And he goes, well, I want it to be uh, 24 by 24. And, uh, and that's really all. So I thought, well, perfect. So this is uh, William S. Hart, who's another um, silent film star and uh, another just great, great face, um, but actually photoshopped his body onto another one of his body. So it's the same guy, but two different images that I combined to, to get this. Um, uh, I was really happy with the way this piece turned out. The, it's called Wyatt's Gift because um, that it's called a quirk. It's that little whip that he's holding, I guess that's his uh, right hand. It's like a, a riding crop. And uh, he was friends with Wyatt Earp. In fact, I think he was a pallbearer at Wyatt Earp's funeral. And so I really like that mix of Hollywood and real cowboys that kind of come together. And even um, William Hart and Buck Jones were both like real cowboys uh, before they got into movies. Um, so it's called Wyatt's Gift because he gave him that, uh, that quirk before he died. David, could you talk a little bit about how you Photoshop that in? How do you do that? Well, if you, it's a good question. And if you'll wait just a little bit, we're gonna go through the whole process. Oh, perfect, thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, you've seen some of my uh, variable pieces. You know, we've seen lots of stuff on the design type wallpapery backgrounds. And we saw some that had like kind of the stylized uh, landscapes and um, I, I wanted something that I could just do a little cleaner and simpler. Um, this is actually on like silver which is hard to see but it's silver paint and then it just has like this expressionistic brush stroke and then uh, the rodeo rider on top of it and I was listening to some 50s rock and roll or something so that's where the Oh, it's from the 70s song, Boom Shaka Laka. 
So um, that's where the title comes from. Um, but I'm still kind of enamored with uh, how to do this, but I, I don't know quite how to put these pieces together. The, the brush stroke isn't like a brush stroke. I was thinking that I would take a big fat brush and just do like a one pass and make this mark with it. But as I said earlier, my colors are sort of transparent and semi-transparent. So wherever that red is, it's gonna be seen through the figure. So I couldn't figure out like how to paint around the figure. So this is actually an illustrated brush stroke <laughs> of all the weird things. So I kind of drew out this brush stroke shape and then painted it in because I still can't figure out how to do like a big brush stroke and then paint the figure on top of it without that brush stroke coming through the figure. But um, I liked how um, fun that was. Okay, let's move along here. So this is another similar one. Uh, same idea, same results. I just got the cue, we need to move along here. <laughs> let's um, uh, let's uh, skip forward uh, quickly to uh, 14. So this is kind of my process from start to finish. And um, this is my piece for Cabaret Cowgirl. And um, I found this photo, which I thought was really cool. And I loved what she's wearing a lot. And I like the pose, but you know, the art director in me is now, but what's going on with her face? And this looks almost like some kind of painted backdrop that she's on. Like this is some kind of a, you know, studio portrait, like you go from, um, uh, you know, did you get it like Elitches or something, you know, where they dress you up in cowboy costumes. But I was really unhappy with her face. I mean, it almost looks like a guy in drag to me. So I'm like, okay, let, let's see what we can find here. So if you go to the next one, um, this is uh, Louise Brooks, who is just like this dazzling beauty from the twenties, very iconic girl. And I was just loving the uh, cabaret vibe that she was getting and the great look that she has and the lighting. And so again, we're kind of mixing these Hollywood and real worlds together here. So if you go forward one more, actually go back one, please to the one more, yeah. So if you look at her right hand, it's kind of hard to tell what's going on there. It looks like she may be holding a drink or a shot glass or something, but it's not very clear. Um, and I was liking that cabaret vibe. So I asked my wife to hand model for me a cigarette holder because they had like the long cigarette holders in the twenties. So this is my wife here posing and uh, liked her hand a lot. So if you go forward now, one more. So this is my completed Photoshopped image that I worked from. So we have the body of the original uh, figure. We have my wife's hand with the cigarette holder. We have Louise's Brooks's face. And then I don't know where the hat came from, but that's like a different hat all together with the different background. So this is what I use. I would project all of this onto my surface, draw it out, and then I would paint it in. And then if you go to the next one, please, this is the final piece. So I would have to like make up all of the colors because as you saw, it's all black and white, uh, but I was um, happy with the way this one came out as well. It's just stunning. There was one question that this kind of goes along with, how do you distinguish between being an artist and an illustrator? Well, an illustrator is doing something for a commercial, there's a commercial purpose. Somebody hires them, says, I need you to make a picture for whatever, and there's some sort of commercial or business that happens. You know, they're selling something, they're promoting a book, it's accompanying an article. There's some kind of commercial business associated with the project. Um, an illustrator is an artist, I think, and vice versa, but um, for fine art, there isn't, the, the idea starts with the artist. You know, there isn't a commercial component to it, if that clarifies it. Very much so, thank you. Yeah. 
Let's uh, roll along here. This is uh, How I Wish, another serendipity piece. Unfortunately, around death, <laughs> um, I had a good friend die while I was uh, working on this. I've known him since high school and we used to play uh, poker on uh, Friday nights. Uh, that was always the highlight of my week when I was in my uh, rebellious, uh, bad attitude uh, days. And um, I, I changed the, the, the pattern at the bottom. It's hard to see, but there's actually card symbols in those crowns um, to kind of honor my friend's uh, memory. Uh, so in, in the song, or the title is from a song by Pink Floyd, How I Wish, How I Wish You Were Here. But uh, fun piece to him. And here's Tom Mix, who's another one of those, uh, uh, like Buck Jones and uh, William S. Hart, silent movie star. Another great face though. Similar idea, this is uh, Guy Weedham, who started the Calvary Stampede, but I, was, uh, I liked his pose very much. Gypsy cowgirl, another Photoshop face on a cowgirl's body using a uh, bandana pattern in the, in the background. Uh, but I like this idea too, of this uh, kind of gypsy with the scarves and the necklace and so on. And again, that yellow is kind of what I paint everything. You can really see it coming through like in her shirt and the rope. And this one is uh, Mabel, started out being Mabel Strickland, who was a famous rodeo writer from like the early 1900s. And uh, this was during uh, COVID. I painted this uh, last year when COVID was really starting to be a thing and uh, certainly influencing how I was feeling about painting and so on. And Mabel Strickland was a very handsome woman, good looking woman, but her smiling face just wasn't cutting it for me. And there was something that I, uh, it, it just, you know, it just wasn't matching how I was feeling at the time. And then I was going through my Twitter feed and uh, somebody I followed posted this image of her grandmother who was a Holocaust survivor and who had just recently passed away. And I just loved her face because, you know, she was like, you know, I'd seen some stuff and I've been around the block, but I'm still here, you know? And I just thought that that was like this, that was the attitude and the feeling that I needed to put out there uh, for this piece, so. That was at Coors last year. This started out as a guy doing a rope trick on top of a horse, but I felt sorry for the horse when I seen these things. These guys can't really be jumping up and down on horses, so I edited the horse out of the scene. But again, the stylized landscape behind the figure. Let's roll on here. And this is um, In Our Dreams We Fly, which is, uh, what was that Coors last year? This is the one that got so many bids on it. Um, this is another composited scene but this is really the woman that was, she really did this. And the photo was of her jumping over a car, but I changed the car, I changed the background, but she really did do this. And um, again, I thought it was a nice metaphor for um, these COVID times, you know, overcoming obstacles and, um, you know, kind of a leaping over technology. And uh, you know, it's hard to see her face, but I mean, she's just having like the time of her life, you know, she's not only surviving, but she's thriving and enjoying it in the process. Um, so I, I, I was just really enamored with the, the whole spirit of uh, what she was doing. And I admired her bravery too. I mean, I can't imagine standing on top of two horses, galloping and then jumping over an automobile and then landing and not breaking your neck in the process. Um, and if you look, I mean, that one horse is so much higher than the other. I mean, that can't be like an easy landing. So, uh, but that's, uh, that's what happened. And uh, this piece um, 
had many, many bids on it and the buyer was determined she was gonna have it. And I've had a couple other people uh, reach out to me and ask me about it. And what I'm working on behind me now is kind of a similar piece where she wanted uh, something similar. And this is actually a little too similar, but I'm liking the piece, but it's, I prefer not to do the same pieces over or too similar. Uh, let's roll on here, please. This is Vigilant with the uh, cowboy watching over his herd. Again, a completely composited scene with an original cowboy in vintage colors. I, I have no idea where these colors came from. It gave me an idea though that uh, in future pieces, I think I wanna like put some kind of Morse code message in the, in the cows. You know, I could use the cows as like dots and dashes and, and say something, but I don't know what I would say right now. So, but uh, that'll, that'll be for a future piece. I know you kind of touched on this, but there was one question that came through. Um, on many paintings, you use an orange line as outline, why? Because everything looks better with an orange line around it. <laughs> <laughs> it makes the figure stand out. It, it just gives it a certain glow. Um, I don't do it on the ones where the pattern uh, blends in, but it really does um, make the figure pop out more. Um, this is hard to say, but this one has um, a piece on there, it has uh, the orange around it as well. What I'm working on does as well too. Um, again, it just, I can't get rid of it. It just, uh, it just makes the figures kind of leap off the, the, the page. This is uh, called Rosalita. She was, um, I, I think they call them Adelitas, which were uh, women soldiers of the Mexican revolution. I started, this is the most recent piece. I just finished it a couple of weeks ago. And when I was working on it, the shooting up in Boulder was big news. And I'm like, great, here I am with this woman with her rifle front and center. And I was almost wondering if I shouldn't stop this piece and maybe work on something else, but I decided to keep going. It, I, I'm trying not to promote guns and gun violence here at all, but I was more trying to honor the spirit of these uh, women who were very strong and beautiful and you know they were fighting for their cause. I've been listening to um, Frida Kahlo podcasts here lately and um, so the whole piece is kind of Frida Kahlo-ish influenced as, as well. And again, I'm making up all of the uh, colors here. The background is gold. I wanna learn how to gold, this gold paint, but I wanna learn how to gold leaf. Um, that's one of my goals this year. Is that it? Is there another one or is that all? That's it. Well, there was one question and then we can open it up to people. They can unmute themselves. But how do you decide the price of your paintings? Well, that's another good question. And that's something that is always under supervision. Um, I, I started with a price and um, I, I based it off of um, the the area of the of the piece, you know, the, the size of the piece. So there's kind of a by the square inch is sort of how it gets priced out. Um, it gets a little cheaper the bigger the piece is, those cheaper per square inch it gets because that formula doesn't hold. Um, but it's kind of a it's a weird thing, you know. I have sold out at the last three quarter shows, and I keep thinking maybe, you know, I need to raise my prices some. And I, I, they are, excuse me, they are going up a bit, but um, they're not um, like doubling or, or tripling. And I'd hate to be in a spot where all my business dries up because it's, they're suddenly priced myself out of the market. But it's a tough question. It's hard to price your stuff. I've asked gallery owners for help and a lot of times they will just not answer the question. They want the artist to do that. But the best thing that I could do is just find people of similar work. And I think my stuff isn't that similar to other people, but I try and find something similar and see what they're pricing it at and, and kind of go by there. Can I ask Are you working a particular gallery yet at this point? Am I working with a gallery? Yes. Are you I work with um, Giacobbe Fritz in Santa Fe. I work with a band in Denver. 
and I work with Lovitz in uh, Tulsa. Awesome. Yeah. Question? Um, the Cherry Creek Arts Festival, are you in it this year? I am not. I, um, it takes me a long time to make a piece. Like this piece I'm working on now will probably take about two to three weeks to, before it gets finished. And I, I, I can't make that many pieces. The galleries are wanting pieces. I mean, I have a lot of people wanting stuff right now and it's a pretty big commitment. You know, it would take about six months to make enough pieces for the show. And in the meantime, I wouldn't have any income either. So as much as I like Cherry Creek, I probably won't be doing it in the near future. It is a much more reduced festival this year. Is it? Yes, and it's going to be behind the mall along the grass that goes mm. on the river there. Yeah. So they can't put too many booths in there. Yeah. But Are you associated with the festival? Sorry? Are you associated with the Cherry Creek? Well, only because I sit on the board here in Cherry Creek. So it is oh. such a major event every year in that respect. And I sit on the steering committee too. And that's where I learned that they were going to put it behind there. Yeah. Um, so, uh, but I certainly understand your reasoning for not, not being- I liked it. I, I, and I would like to do it again, but it's, um, I, I have to kind of pick and choose where I send pieces of now. Of course. Which is not where I started. <laughs> when I'm crying in the hotel room wondering what I'm gonna do next and now I'm turning galleries away and turning shows away. So. It's a good place to be. Yeah, yeah. Any other questions? Yep, this was wonderful, David. I love your work. It is, and to see all of it this way because your your pieces sell so quickly that it's not as if we've seen six, eight of them at, at the same time. So this was so much yeah. fun. I well, thank you. I've been uh, I've been really surprised at how quickly stuff has been selling. You know, I was never expecting that. You know, there I do have. Oh, go ahead. I have a, a print available of uh, this guy if anyone is interested too. Mm. This was another piece that sold really quickly. Prints will be larger. Um, maybe it's a little better there. Where do you so, sell your prints? I mean, how would um, I Through the galleries, but this one I'm gonna sell through my website. But if anybody's interested, they can email me. Make it they're, <laughs> they're good high quality prints that's they're hard to tell from the original looking at them next to each other. There was one early question. Do you think there are certain personality traits that are helpful to an artist? And if so, what would they be? Oh, That's boy, I don't know that. Odd question. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I think you need to be a little bit hard headed. Um, oh. And you have to kind of be willing to kind of keep crashing forward because you know what when, when I was young I was um I kept hearing all the starving artist stories and that kind of scared me from really trying to pursue it way back then but I think there's some truth to it you know and even when I was doing this professionally there's some years where it was wow what am I doing here you know um so you, and there's a lot of self-doubt and self-judgment that goes on, you know, is this any good? Am I any good? What am I doing? You know, there's a lot of that that goes on. You have these conversations with yourself. You go onto Instagram and 10 minutes later, you feel like I should just give up because there's so many great artists out there. So yeah, I think you need to be a little bit hard-headed and you need to be a little bit, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep going. I'm gonna keep trying, you know, I'm gonna, keep pushing my my vision it, it's almost like you kind of have to do it rather than you than anything but again I was doing it for myself I was originally and 
that's why it's surprising to see the reaction I'm getting now because these are all you know pretty personal pieces for me. So I hope that answers the question. It's a good question. Could you give your website again, please? It's just my name. Oh, it's it's in the look in the chat. I wrote it in the chat. Thank you. Thank you. Well, David, thank you so, so much for Well, thank you. Today. I hope it wasn't too boring. <laughs> oh, not not for a minute boring. I, I love your work and it was so fun to listen to you explain the process and how you've gotten to where you are today. And it's exciting that you're so beloved by everyone. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you well, so, so much from all of us. And know that um, this recording will be on our website too, if you ever want to send it to any one of your potential clients. So. Oh, well, thanks. I might do that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's great. All right, well.